Cambridge English Advanced One, published by Cambridge University Press and Cambridge English Language Assessment, 2014. This recording is copyright. CD One. This is the Cambridge English Advanced Test One. I'm going to give you the instructions for this test. I'll introduce each part of the test and give you time to look at the questions. At the start of each piece, you'll hear this sound. You'll hear each piece twice. Remember, while you're listening, write your answers on the question paper. You'll have five minutes at the end of the test. To copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet, there'll now be a pause. Please ask any questions now because you must not speak during the test. Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear three different extracts. For questions one to six. Choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. You hear two friends talking about a new office building. Now look at questions one and two. So, what's it like working in that ultra-modern building? Well, really weird at first, but I'm getting used to it. One thing is not having your own desk, but I've worked like that before. The latest thing is that you get moved around different parts of the building. How are people coping? Varying degrees of success, as you can imagine. <laughs> the technology available is amazing. Everybody has a mobile laptop, a mobile phone, so you can work anywhere. With others by yourself in a funky design space in a space like a garden, <laughs> that's a bit tough. People like to define and personalise their working area. They're really taken out of their comfort zone. Work isn't a place anymore. It's what you do that counts. Teams aren't fixed either. You can be in a different one each week, but there's plenty of direction, and you know what needs to be done. How do you feel about all the moving around? It's supposed to be healthier for you. I'm not sure. It hardly matches up to a session in the gym. But sometimes you can bump into somebody unexpectedly, and it's good to bounce ideas off each other. It's thought that'll make people focus better on their output, but that remains to be seen. So, what's it like working in that ultra-modern building? Well, really weird at first, but I'm getting used to it. One thing is not having your own desk, but I've worked like that before. The latest thing is that you get moved around different parts of the building. How are people coping? Varying degrees of success, as you can imagine. <laughs> the technology available is amazing. Everybody has a mobile laptop, a mobile phone, so you can work anywhere. With others by yourself in a funky design space in a space like a garden, <laughs> that's a bit tough. People like to define and personalise their working area. They're really taken out of their comfort zone. Work isn't a place anymore. It's what you do that counts. Teams aren't fixed either. You can be in a different one each week, but there's plenty of direction, and you know what needs to be done. How do you feel about all the moving around? It's supposed to be healthier for you. I'm not sure. It hardly matches up to a session in the gym, but sometimes you can bump into somebody unexpectedly, and it's good to bounce ideas off each other. It's thought that'll make people focus better on their output, but that remains to be seen. Extract two. You hear two friends discussing business travel. Now look at questions three and four.
So, you're back from the Far East. Do you reckon the company will be cutting back on trips like that? Well, you'd hope they'd make more use of digital communication. Things like video. But honestly, there's often no real alternative to face-to-face -face meetings. Mm. In certain circumstances, anyway. I suppose it all comes down to being sure to book with the companies whose planes use biofuel. Responsible travel, you could call it. Mm. Because there's no way I can foresee business travel doing anything other than growing in the future. Estimates put it between 10 and 15 percent, or so I read recently in an analyst report. Hmm, that's certainly what they're saying. So let's hope airlines and rail companies worldwide will be responsible when it comes to planning. There'll have to be plenty of that to deal with the expected growth. All too often they just concentrate on immediate results, like the instant profit they seem to be obsessed with. Though obviously they do have to make things pay. And it's always a good thing for them if they can promote their plans by saying how much work will be provided. Above all, though, what's needed is a strategy to cope with what future trends are likely to throw up. You're right there. So, you're back from the Far East. Do you reckon the company will be cutting back on trips like that? Well, you'd hope they'd make more use of digital communication. Things like video. But honestly, there's often no real alternative to face-to-face -face meetings. Mm. In certain circumstances, anyway. I suppose it all comes down to being sure to book with the companies whose planes use biofuel. Responsible travel, you could call it. Mm. Because there's no way I can foresee business travel doing anything other than growing in the future. Estimates put it between 10 and 15%. Oh, so I read recently in an analyst report. Hmm, that's certainly what they're saying. So let's hope airlines and rail companies worldwide will be responsible when it comes to planning. There'll have to be plenty of that to deal with the expected growth. All too often they just concentrate on immediate results, like the instant profit they seem to be obsessed with. Though obviously they do have to make things pay. And it's always a good thing for them if they can promote their plans by saying how much work will be provided. Above all, though, what's needed is a strategy to cope with what future trends are likely to throw up. You're right there. Extract 3. You hear two friends talking about some research. Now look at questions 5 and 6. I saw a fascinating programme last night about research into human self-interest. What's to research? Selfishness is just not giving others a second thought, surely? No, there were experiments. They showed that when you give people a financial windfall, they're happier if you insist they spend it on themselves. <laughs> Who wouldn't be? You're missing the point. So, what did the research consist of exactly? Well, they gave two groups of people a sum of cash. One group could choose between keeping it or giving it to charity. The other group had to spend it on themselves. And the second group, virtually forced to be self-interested, turned out to be the happiest. Those that voluntarily kept cash were less happy, presumably because of the undertow of guilt of having made that choice. Mm, I'm glad I didn't have to. Not easy. One thing I took from the programme was how it's a good idea to pre-commit to any activities that are self-interested – so, make plans to see friends that are hard to break. Buy cinema tickets for next weekend now. You see, apparently the less freedom you have to back out, the more fun you'll have when the time comes. Because doing something for others instead won't feel like an option. Hmm, that's an interesting angle. I saw a fascinating programme last night about research into human self-interest. What's to research? Selfishness is just not giving others a second thought, surely? No, there were experiments. They showed that when you give people a financial windfall, they're happier if you insist they spend it on themselves. <laughs> Who wouldn't be? You're missing the point. So, what did the research consist of exactly? Well, they gave two groups of people a sum of cash. One group could choose between keeping it or giving it to charity. The other group had to spend it on themselves. 
And the second group, virtually forced to be self-interested, turned out to be the happiest. Those that voluntarily kept cash were less happy, presumably because of the undertow of guilt of having made that choice. Mm, I'm glad I didn't have to. Not easy. One thing I took from the programme was how it's a good idea to pre-commit to any activities that are self-interested. So, make plans to see friends that are hard to break. Buy cinema tickets for next weekend now. You see, apparently the less freedom you have to back out, the more fun you'll have when the time comes. Because doing something for others instead won't feel like an option. Hmm, that's an interesting angle. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear a man called Stephen Kane giving a presentation about research into a cargo of children's bath toys which were lost at sea. For questions 7 to 14, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. Hi, I'm Stephen Kane. I want to tell you about my research into a cargo of children's bath toys lost at sea, which turned up in some unexpected places. About 20 years ago, an American company ordered 30,000 plastic bath toys from a Chinese manufacturer, packed in sets of four, a green frog, a red beaver, a classic yellow duck, and a rather uncharacteristically blue turtle. These were dispatched by sea. But en route, a storm washed the cargo overboard and somehow the container split open, releasing the bath toys to float away on the waves. So how did I get involved? I'm a college lecturer, but not teaching anything like economics or even geography. Media studies is my field. I set my students a vacation project and one guy based his on a TV program about these bath toys. It made fascinating reading. Ever since, I've been trying to trace them, temporarily giving up my academic career to travel the world in the process. Every year since the accident, bath toys have turned up as far as Hawaii and northern Europe, but first appeared on the coast of Alaska, where I began my search. There I met people whose hobby is beachcombing, they had hordes of bath toys to show me, along with sneakers, part of another lost cargo, as well as the regular flotsam and jetsam discarded by the currents. But the amazing thing is, through these discoveries, the bath toys have made an incredible contribution to scientific research. For example, to obtain information about tides and circular currents, oceanographers often release a small number of drift bottles with messages inside to track where they land. But here were 30,000 objects to trace and document. They've provided information that's been put into use right away in the shipping industry and should eventually prove invaluable to the oil industry. I was having great fun, but some of this diminished in Hawaii when I was shown how the bath toys lose their identity in the mass of marine pollutants covering some beaches there. Rumors abounded of poisoned dolphins and porpoises, and I saw the remains of a seabird with 32 different types of plastic in its stomach. So I decided to investigate other aspects of the bath toy's journey and traveled to China in search of the factory, which I thought of as their birthplace rather than their place of manufacture. I was able to track down not only the building, 
but also the machine they'd been made on and the person who'd operated it. One final challenge was to follow the route of bath toys to Europe via the polar ice cap. An easy option would have been to board an airliner and get an idea of the vast frozen wastes from above. But I wanted to get through, though, so I opted for enlisting as a crew member on an icebreaker. No ordinary vessel, this, but one tasked with cutting a sea passage through the frozen waste. We found no frogs or beavers, but I felt a renewed respect for the toy's remarkable endurance. So, before I go on, are there any questions that you might have? Now you'll hear part two again. Hi, I'm Stephen Kane. I want to tell you about my research into a cargo of children's bath toys lost at sea which turned up in some unexpected places. About 20 years ago, an American company ordered 30,000 plastic bath toys from a Chinese manufacturer, packed in sets of four, a green frog, a red beaver, a classic yellow duck, and a rather uncharacteristically blue turtle. These were dispatched by sea. But en route, a storm washed the cargo overboard and somehow the container split open, releasing the bath toys to float away on the waves. So how did I get involved? I'm a college lecturer, but not teaching anything like economics or even geography. Media studies is my field. I sent my students a vacation project, and one guy based his on a TV program about these bath toys. It made fascinating reading. Ever since, I've been trying to trace them, temporarily giving up my academic career to travel the world in the process. Every year since the accident, bath toys have turned up as far as Hawaii and northern Europe, but first appeared on the coast of Alaska, where I began my search. There I met people whose hobby is beachcombing. They had hordes of bath toys to show me, along with sneakers, part of another lost cargo, as well as the regular flotsam and jetsam discarded by the currents. But the amazing thing is, through these discoveries, the bath toys have made an incredible contribution to scientific research. For example, to obtain information about tides and circular currents, oceanographers often release a small number of drift bottles with messages inside to track where they land. But here were 30,000 objects to trace and document they've provided information that's been put into use right away in the shipping industry and should eventually prove invaluable to the oil industry. I was having great fun, but some of this diminished in Hawaii when I was shown how the bath toys lose their identity in the mass of marine pollutants covering some beaches there. Rumors abounded of poisoned dolphins and porpoises, and I saw the remains of a seabird with 32 different types of plastic in its stomach. So I decided to investigate other aspects of the bath toy's journey and traveled to China in search of the factory, which I thought of as their birthplace rather than their place of manufacture. I was able to track down not only the building, but also the machine they'd been made on and the person who'd operated it. One final challenge was to follow the route of bath toys to Europe via the polar ice cap. An easy option would have been to board an airliner and get an idea of the vast frozen wastes from above. But I wanted to get through, though, so I opted for enlisting as a crew member on an icebreaker. No ordinary vessel, this, but one tasked with cutting a sea passage through the frozen waste. We found no frogs or beavers, but... I felt a renewed respect for the toy's remarkable endurance. So, before I go on, are there any questions that you might have? That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear part of an interview in which two scientists called Jessica Conway and Paul Flower 
are talking about exploration and discovery. For questions 15 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have 70 seconds to look at part 3. Welcome to today's programme, where I'm talking to scientists Jessica Conway and Paul Flower about exploration and discovery. First of all, Jessica, these days surely everything on Earth has been discovered and mapped? Absolutely not. We've begun. You can use satellites to estimate the shape of the landscape under the oceans, for example, but it's only an estimate. In the Antarctic recently, investigating undersea volcanoes, we found a crater in the ocean floor, about four kilometres across and well over one kilometre deep. And it wasn't on any map. We had no idea it was there. And that just amazed me, because there's nowhere beyond the shoreline where we can trip over such big geographical features that we don't already know about. And are you finding many new animal species around these underwater craters? Well, as we get closer to finding everything out there, it's going to get progressively harder to find new species. But at the moment, there's no sign of the rate of discovery slackening off. The real question is just how many more new species there might be there. At least one new species has been discovered every month over the 35 years we've been exploring deep-sea craters, and we've still got plenty left to record. So you're clearly expecting to make similar geographical finds elsewhere? Sure. We're going to be exploring these sorts of features and comparing what we find for quite some while. There are still huge unexplored areas, so there'll be lots to focus our minds on in the coming decades, with the aim of all of us across different disciplines building up a kind of jigsaw puzzle of what exists where. What do you think, Paul? Well, our different backgrounds make for very different research methods, but the ultimate goal is the same. For example, recent work on glaciers by a US researcher has helped me re-evaluate my own data on climate change. In this business, the figures can alter from day to day, and you have to keep on top of it. Now, Paul, you've actually walked where no one's ever walked before. What's that like? Yes, every year I go to Greenland climb new mountains and travel on previously untouched ice caps. There are literally hundreds of these. There's a sense of freedom. I think that's what I get. You're still aware your body is exhausted, and yet by travelling to new areas every time, there's this renewed feeling that this is where I'm meant to be. It's an experience like no other. What about other people accessing remote areas? You still see great areas where there are no roads, no villages, no permanent habitation whatsoever, despite the current population explosion and the need for development. I'm obviously keen to explore uncharted territory, but not, of course, with the checklist mentality of the wealthy globetrotter. These days, of course, everyone can go everywhere, it seems. But surely, in coming generations, the urge to explore will begin to dwindle as these places are visited, catalogued, mapped. I wouldn't want the next generation thinking, Puff, it's all been done before. 
And besides, I can get it all off the internet because you can't, you see. You can spend your life looking at a computer with the world's best search engines, but it's nowhere near the same as actually standing there on a mountain top. You can do all the research you like, but when you stand there, it's so intense, so life giving. It doesn't matter that someone might have been there before because now you are. And regardless of your standpoint on green issues, I think people will always hold that view. Now you'll hear part three again. Welcome to today's programme, where I'm talking to scientists Jessica Conway and Paul Flower about exploration and discovery. First of all, Jessica, these days, surely everything on Earth has been discovered and mapped? Absolutely not. We've begun. You can use satellites to estimate the shape of the landscape under the oceans, for example. But it's only an estimate. In the Antarctic recently, investigating undersea volcanoes, we found a crater in the ocean floor, about four kilometers across and well over one kilometer deep. And it wasn't on any map. We had no idea it was there. And that just amazed me, because there's nowhere beyond the shoreline where we can trip over such big geographical features that we don't already know about. And are you finding many new animal species around these underwater craters? Well, as we get closer to finding everything out there, it's going to get progressively harder to find new species. But at the moment, there's no sign of the rate of discovery slackening off. The real question is just how many more new species there might be there. At least one new species has been discovered every month over the 35 years we've been exploring deep sea craters. And we've still got plenty left to record. So you're clearly expecting to make similar geographical finds elsewhere. Sure, we're going to be exploring these sorts of features and comparing what we find for quite some while. There are still huge unexplored areas, so there'll be lots to focus our minds on in the coming decades. With the aim of all of us across different disciplines building up a kind of jigsaw puzzle of what exists where. What do you think, Paul? Well, our different backgrounds make for very different research methods, but the ultimate goal is the same. For example, recent work on glaciers by a U.S. researcher has helped me reevaluate my own data on climate change. In this business, the figures can alter from day to day, and you have to keep on top of it. Now, Paul, you've actually walked where no one's ever walked before. What's that like? Yes, every year I go to Greenland. Climb new mountains and travel on previously untouched ice caps. There are literally hundreds of these. There's a sense of freedom. I think that's what I get. You're still aware your body is exhausted, and yet by travelling to new areas every time, there's this renewed feeling that this is where I'm meant to be. It's an experience like no other. What about other people accessing remote areas? You still see great areas where there are no roads, no villages, no permanent habitation whatsoever, despite the current population explosion and the need for development. I'm obviously keen to explore uncharted territory, but not, of course, with the checklist mentality of the wealthy globetrotter. These days, of course, everyone can go everywhere, it seems. But surely, in coming generations, the urge to explore will begin to dwindle as these places are visited, catalogued, mapped. I wouldn't want the next generation thinking, Puff, it's all been done before. And besides, I can get it all off the internet because you can't, you see. You can spend your life looking at a computer with the world's best search engines, but it's nowhere near the same as actually standing there on a mountain top. You can do all the research you like, but when you stand there, it's so intense, so life giving. It doesn't matter that someone might have been there before because now you are. And regardless of your standpoint on green issues, I think people will always hold that view. That's the end of part three.
Now turn to part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You'll hear five short extracts in which people are talking about taking up a new sport. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H why each speaker took up their particular sport. Now look at task two. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H what advice each speaker gives about taking up a sport. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds to look at part four. Speaker 1 I started judo when I was 10. I'd been good at other martial arts, so I didn't think it'd be too difficult. And I went along because my friend kept going on about how brilliant the instructor was and how it'd do me good. I was soon taking part in competitions with people my age and older, even though I didn't think I was that great. But I got there by sheer force of will, I think. And I'd say that's the key. Knowing what you think you can achieve and then making yourself go that little bit further each time. Yes, watching what you eat can go some way towards helping you succeed, but it's what goes on in your head that really counts. Speaker 2 I recently moved from athletics to powerlifting. It happened quite by chance. One day in the gym, out of curiosity, I set myself the task of finding out the maximum weight I could lift. It wasn't that much, actually, but still enough to get me hooked. Although I'm still quite new to the sport, I'm keeping up pretty well, and I'm hoping to go to the USA soon to do a course with the coach that's over there who's got a great reputation. That's essential, I think, to have someone on board who knows their stuff when it comes to training. That'll take you a long way down the road to success, especially as your fitness improves. Speaker 3 I picked up karate a few years ago, my prime motivation being to take part in the fighting bit, I think. You're pitting yourself against another person, and you've got to win. I've probably got an addictive personality where training's concerned, but with any contests I take part in, I tend to do really well as a result. It's a good feeling knowing that kids follow your example. I'd say it's a rewarding thing to fix your sights on. Obviously, if you're not very good... That isn't going to happen, but if you can dish it out in this sport, your standing really goes up, and that's a good place to be. Speaker 4 Doing any sport brings huge rewards, and among them is the opportunity to make all kinds of friends once you get to a certain level. And for anyone wishing to take up my sport, wheelchair racing, I'd stress the need to have total, unquestioning faith in your own ability, because without that, you're going absolutely nowhere. It certainly got me a long way, because my international competitions have literally taken me all over the place, and I'm really grateful for what the sport has given me in that respect. And that's what I went into it for, after all. Speaker 5 I wasn't that keen to play badminton when my friends suggested it, but in the end it was a case of anything to keep them quiet. Anyway, to my utter astonishment, I turned out to be a natural at it, even beating off one or two who'd been competing for years, so that persuaded me and I've been thrashing the shuttlecock across the net ever since. I can get very into it though at times, and I have to be careful so that I make space for other things. My coach always tells me to maintain a sense of proportion, and I'm with him on that. After all, what's the point if it's not fun?
Now you'll hear part four again. Speaker one. I started judo when I was ten. I'd been good at other martial arts, so I didn't think it'd be too difficult. And I went along because my friend kept going on about how brilliant the instructor was and how it'd do me good. I was soon taking part in competitions with people my age and older, even though I didn't think I was that great. But I got there by sheer force of will, I think. And I say that's the key: knowing what you think you can achieve, and then making yourself go that little bit further each time. Yes, watching what you eat can go some way towards helping you succeed, but it's what goes on in your head that really counts. Speaker two. I recently moved from athletics to powerlifting. It happened quite by chance. One day in the gym, out of curiosity, I set myself the task of finding out the maximum weight I could lift. It wasn't that much actually, but still enough to get me hooked. Although I'm still quite new to the sport, I'm keeping up pretty well, and I'm hoping to go to the USA soon to do a course with the coach that's over there, who's got a great reputation. That's essential, I think, to have someone on board who knows their stuff when it comes to training. That will take you a long way down the road to success, especially as your fitness improves. Speaker three. I picked up karate a few years ago. My prime motivation being to take part in the fighting bit. I think you're pitting yourself against another person, and you've got to win. I've probably got an addictive personality where training's concerned, but with any contests I take part in, I tend to do really well as a result. It's a good feeling knowing that kids follow your example. I'd say it's a rewarding thing to fix your sights on. Obviously, if you're not very good, that isn't going to happen. But if you can dish it out in this sport, your standing really goes up, and that's a good place to be. Speaker four. Doing any sport brings huge rewards, and among them is the opportunity to make all kinds of friends once you get to a certain level. And for anyone wishing to take up my sport, wheelchair racing, I'd stress the need to have total, unquestioning faith in your own ability, because without that, you're going absolutely nowhere. It certainly got me a long way, because my international competitions have literally taken me all over the place. And I'm really grateful for what the sport has given me in that respect, and that's what I went into it for, after all. Speaker five. I wasn't that keen to play badminton when my friends suggested it, but in the end, it was a case of anything to keep them quiet. Anyway, to my utter astonishment, I turned out to be a natural at it, even beating off one or two who'd been competing for years. So that persuaded me, and I've been thrashing the shuttlecock across the net ever since. I can get very into it though at times, and I have to be careful so that I make space for other things. My coach always tells me to maintain a sense of proportion, and I'm with him on that. After all, what's the point if it's not fun? That's the end of part four. There'll now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I'll remind you when there's one minute left, so that you're sure to finish in time.
That's the end of the test. Please stop now. Your supervisor will now collect all the question papers and answer sheets.